Hello and welcome to this discussion of the events in Tiananmen Square from 1989. This is one of a series of discussions on events that either helped precipitate or maybe are symptomatic of the end of the Cold War. These discussions are being brought to you by the American Democracy Project here at IPFW as well as the Department of History and the Mike Down Center for Indiana Politics. Our panelists today uh, are two people from the Department of History. We have Ann Livshiz from the Department of History. She's an assistant professor. And then future faculty fellow, Deanna Woolley. Mm -hmm. I do want to mention that these uh, are being recorded by CATV and broadcast on CATV as well as available on MDON. And I want to start with some geography. We always start these discussions with a little bit of geography. There's a map that will come up on the screen in just a second of the, the, the country of China, and that will be followed by a map of Beijing. But kind of help people understand exactly what we're talking about, Deanna. Uh, where is Tiananmen Square in Beijing? Well, where is Beijing, and where is Tiananmen Square within Beijing? Well, Beijing is the capital of China, um, and it's located on the coast, um, about halfway up the coast uh, of China, as you can see on the map right there, and it's in large, uh, bold letters. And Tiananmen Square is located um, uh, kind of in the southeast central section part of Beijing. And uh, that's pretty much, it's one of the largest squares actually, if not the largest square public uh, arena in the world. And, and so how long ago was Tiananmen Square built? Tiananmen Square uh, was, well Tiananmen Square actually began life as Tian Gate, and the gate was built in the Ming Dynasty, uh, somewhere between the 13, uh, 14th century and uh, 15th century, and uh, it was successfully reconstructed and re, uh, rebuilt in later dynasties up until the Qing Dynasty, which ended in 1911. And it was built as a gate, uh, as one of a series actually of six consecutive gates that joined together the walls of uh, Beijing. Um, and these gates acted basically as entrance points into the inner cities within the, uh, within the city complex. And this was a pretty common way for Chinese cities to actually be built, that you would have a series of gates and a series of walls um, in the feudal period. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and in the map here, the Tiananmen Square area is actually in the lower left-hand corner. You can see a yeah. box around the palace there, and, mm -hmm. and Tiananmen Square would then be south of that. The little break in the box uh -huh. uh, would be the actual gate itself. Exactly, yes. The gate is to the north of the square, and the gate actually leads into the Forbidden City, where the Imperial Palace is. Mm -hmm. so. And and so the purpose of the gates and the walls was actually for protection then? Yes, exactly. Um, originally it was. Uh, in 1949, however, Tiananmen Square begins to kind of take on a life of its own because Mao, um, of course, Chairman Mao, who was at that point in charge of the Chinese Communist Party, decides to make Tiananmen Square basically um, an emblem of the Chinese Communist Party and the new Communist China. And so he puts it on banknotes, he puts it on official documentation, the emblem or the seal of Communist Communist China actually has Tiananmen Square on it in the background. And so in this way, he really tries, he really transforms the nature of the square from a, a series of monuments in front of this gate into a, a kind of living symbol, a living place of public gathering and demonstration in and of itself. And this kind of evolves throughout the communist period. And these demonstrations would usually be then pro-government, pro-pride in China. Precisely, precisely, yeah. And um, the, the big parades, the um, mass demonstrations that we all know of from the communist era, uh, these were all held in Tiananmen Square, and especially during the Cultural Revolution in the late 1960s. In 1966, Mao really tries to redo Beijing, uh, reconstruct Beijing, and there, at that point, the Tiananmen Square is built up even bigger and even larger. And then all of the major public demonstrations of Mao's power during the Cultural Revolution happen in Tiananmen Square. The, the massive, pro, uh, massive parades um, in support of Mao. He speaks to the Red Guards there. And so it really does become uh, the, the symbol, the metaphorical symbol of political power within China itself. But at this point, it's still a symbol of the regime's power and mm -hmm. the regime's might. Okay. Now, Anne, uh, of course, you're here because uh, we like having you on these shows, but uh, there, are, there are significant Soviet-China uh, relations to, mm -hmm. to discuss here. The Soviet Union and China share a very long border uh, and on the surface appear to have a similar political ideology. Uh, but, uh, you know, so what were relationships like between the USSR and China in, say, the 1960s, 1970s, leading up to the time period we're going to get into? 
Um, it's, a, um, it's so interesting because I think if you could choose one word to describe it, the word would be rocky. Um, <laughs> You would think that the Soviet Union would be thrilled that there was that um, you know that when co when China turned communist that you have this you know very large um, um, neighboring country that uh, became communist without Soviet you know without Soviet intervention and without Soviet troops needing um, they would needing say to Soviet the, help right right yes. that, well yeah. <laughs> I avoided using that word actually because this, from the Soviet's point of view they did help of course but mm -hmm. not that was not really the the view that the Chinese um, uh, the Chinese Communist Party had um, and so. It, the, the issue was that as long as Stalin was alive, um, Mao was willing to defer to him. The Soviet Union saw itself as the communist, as the leading communist country, the country that everybody, um, uh, well, everybody really, but in particular communist countries uh, and communist parties were supposed to look up to. And Mao was willing to do that as long as Stalin was alive, kind of defer to his seniority, defer to his, you know, revolutionary cred. Um, once Mao, uh, once Stalin died, um, uh, Mao did not have the same feelings about um, Stalin's successors, and particularly somebody like Khrushchev. Um, Mao was really not. Mao, now with Stalin dead, uh, Mao saw himself as the senior communist leader, and he really did not want to defer to Khrushchev and, by extension, to the Soviet Union. And this is where the problems really. Um, really begin, especially once Khrushchev starts to carry out the reforms in the Soviet Union. He starts to criticize, um, uh, criticize I mean, very selectively, of course, but um, criticize certain Stalinist policies. All of these things um, really upset Mao a lot, in part because he felt that, um, you know, the, the, the policies that Khrushchev was promoting, both um, domestic reforms um, and the emphasis on sort of on economic, um, on economic transformations, and in particular, um, the, the changes in international relations and the changes in the way the Soviet Union was supposed to be relating to other imperialist, um, you know, capitalist countries, all of this um, really upset Mao a lot. In particular, he was not happy about peaceful coexistence, um, and he really felt that um, the Soviet Union under Khrushchev's leadership uh, bet uh, betrayed the revolutionary ideals and was no longer a viable model for revolutionary development for the rest of the world. And so um, add to that uh, concerns about the fact the Soviet Union was, um, you know, not, uh, was very selective about the kinds of, you know, weapons and the kinds of technology they were willing to help China with. Add to that the fact that China felt boxed in by having to follow the Soviet model, even though it didn't really work out particularly well for in, in the Chinese conditions. Um, this, all of this led to problems. And, and starting in the 1960s, this is where you see kind of certain marks that really draw, drew the attention of the world. Um, military cooperation between China and the Soviet Union ended in 1960. Um, they started to openly criticize each other. Uh, by the late 60s, you have actual military clashes along that very, well, not along the entire border, but along certain parts of that border between China uh, between China and the Soviet Union, and this is this was proved to be very significant because it had th this rift in the communist bloc. I mean, it certainly was something that nobody really um, nobody really expected, and ultimately contributed to the um, the eventual detente and, of course, the the relationship between the United States and um, uh, and China. And really, there was no interest on the part of the Soviet Union to defer to China. The oh, Soviet absolutely, Union saw itself right. As the com as the right. leader of the communist world, um, and so. Where, where Mao was not willing to bow down to Khrushchev, Khrushchev was not going to bow down oh, to Mao. Yeah. I didn't even mention it because the idea would be, the idea yeah. would be ridiculous. So, so. Yes, it would never happen. But then in 1985, we have sort of an, an interesting moment, an important moment. Uh, we have we have the election of Gorbachev as the general secretary. What did this mean for the relationship? Because it's Gorbachev who eventually sort of, I don't want to say normalizes, but at least mm -hmm. enters into some cordial relationships with China. In 85, when he was uh, when he was chosen as general secretary. What was the reaction? I mean, was, did this forebode good relationship? Um, well, things started to slightly get better actually already in the early um, in the early 80s. Um, there were efforts, you know, there, well, there were statements made by Brezhnev that seemed to be sort of conciliatory towards um, uh, towards China. Um, articles um, criticizing China began to disappear um, already, you know, in after Brezhnev's death before um, before Gorbachev. Be, um, which I was elected, but the improvements were in relationships were, uh, were very, very slow because there were a couple of um, kind of really issues of contention that continued to, that, that really were very serious obstacles to the possibility of an improved relationship. Um, Soviet presence in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's an important thing to note that, you know, that for, from China's point of view, they viewed this as kind of Soviet effort to encircle them. Um, if you may, you may remember from an earlier panel, we mentioned that China was actually uh, one of the countries that joined the boycott mm -hmm. of the 1980, um, of the 
1980 Olympics, uh, Moscow was, um, was supporting Vietnam's occupation of Cambodia, and this is again something that upset China a lot. And so this is where Gorbachev's significance comes in, because when Gorbachev comes in, um, I mean, we have to consider Gorbachev's efforts towards China in the context of the broader things that he was trying to accomplish. It wasn't he didn't come to power. And he didn't, you know, his China was not really his primary goal. But he did need to alleviate the tensions with China so that the Soviet Union could reduce its military forces, uh, reduce its military costs, um, and and kind of and so the ending of the confrontation with China was, was, was in in that sense was very important. And he did end up um, accomplishing that. We see, you know, the announcements by Gorbachev in 1988 um, that the troops in Asia were going to be reduced by 200,000. Definitely reflection of the fact that the Soviet Union feels less insecure about what might uh, go wrong there. We also also see a tremendous growth in trade between the two countries um, over the course of the 1980s, tenfold increase from 81 to 88. Um, and all of this again is sort of is, is, is part of this uh, is part of this normalization. And, and this, is, this sort of brings us to 80, you know we're nearing towards 89, of course, because uh, Gorbachev is um, you know ends up going to China in 89 to sort of and this is supposed to be a public demonstration of um, you know an announcement that things are not going to be better between um, you know between the two countries. Yeah, but before we get that, I want to go back actually right. to, to 1988. In April of 88, Deanna, the uh, Chinese government decides to endorse, I think is the terminology they use, or approve private enterprise. Mm -hmm. What did this really mean for for uh, Chinese people? Well, this actually, um, the background to the private enterprise uh, initiatives happens, uh, uh, actually happens in the in 1970s. And it's part of a, basically, it, within all of the, Mar the countries in the Marxist camp, the view was that there was an, an absolute need for economic restructuring, that somehow, some way, they had to get their economies in line. And this was, of course, because not only was there a global recession that was going on, which was affecting the Marxist economies, um, because many of them had uh, tried to finance their systems through uh, credits from Western uh, capitalist countries, uh, but also because the reforms of the 1960s, that one, uh, the reform wave that Anne had been talking about with Khrushchev, these reforms had pretty much petered out. And so there was the need for a new set of reforms um, to come in. Now, of course, in between the 1970s and Khrushchev, we had had um, the 1968 Prague Spring invasion and really kind of, uh, and also in China, of course, we'd had the Cultural Revolution, kind of a parallel counterpart. And both of these things brought ideology back to the fore and really kind of created conservative wave in the early 1970s. And so by the, 19, um, the late 1970s, kind of a reformist wave is, is moving back forward into the, uh, into the um, forefront. However, in Eastern Europe, um, well, the, the main problem for all of these countries was uh, economic reform is fine. Um, you want to change the system. You want to introduce certain liberalization of market reforms. Uh, that's, not an, uh, that's not a problem. However, any liberalization of the economic system automatically throws into danger the position of the party in, in basically leading society and leading the economy. And so the major question for all of these countries is can you reform economically without reforming politically? And this becomes the major um, upon which the tensions grow. Now, in Eastern Europe, they actually, by the end of the 1980s, try to reform economically and politically to a certain extent. But in China, what, um, what happens after Mao's death in 1976 is that reformer Deng Xiaoping comes to the fore, and he tries to institute a, a, pro a program of economic reform without political reform, basically economic liberalization without democracy. And to a certain extent within the 1980s, he, this program of economic reform is actually quite successful in terms of bringing in certain um, market mechanisms and, and also really raising the standard of living for the country as a whole. Um, now, by this, this doesn't mean that, of course, everybody has now become capitalist, but it does mean that the Chinese economy was already seeing significant changes um, within the 1980s. However, um, these reforms, too, really begin to peter out by the end of the 1980s as well. And uh, the idea of introducing private enterprise is both a positive and a negative in 1988, precisely because um, while private enterprise is seen as a good for the economy and for growing China's economy, for the ordinary person, this is actually going to contribute to a slew of economic conditions and economic problems that they've already been um, increasingly experiencing in the late 1980s. Inflation, growing unemployment, and all of these things were basically unknown um, in these communist countries. And so whereas on the one hand, um, 
the private enterprise and these market mechanisms were going to help to save the Chinese economy, it was also contributing to a growing sense of um, a growing sense of discontent and um, unrest, especially within the camp of students and intellectuals. And, and so it, it, we have people who sort of emerge as leaders then mm -hmm. uh, for these youth movements, people like Hu Yaobang. Uh, mm -hmm. who is often described as pro-market. Some people say pro-market, pro-democracy, pro- because he didn't disentangle yeah. the market effects and the political effects. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, it, it's fair to say. And he's actually uh, building upon a major intellectual trend that starts in the late 1970s. Um, wh basically, Deng Xiaoping tries to institute uh, market reform through the four modernizations. And what he says is he wants to make China a modern economy by modernizing industry, agriculture, technology, and defense. And industry, agriculture, technology, and defense, most of these places actually need a more educated, a more modernized population in order to actually help uh, help these uh, economic sectors grow. And so this actually gives more power to intellectuals um, through these economic reforms, moving it from the 70s into the 80s. And Wing Jiaxing, um, in 1978 builds what is known as the democracy wall, or he doesn't build the democracy wall. He, um, yeah, he, he the wall was already there. It's out there with bricks, mortar, he's <laughs> exactly, going to town. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was a communal effort. Um, he, uh, what he does is he puts up a petition basically calling for the fifth modernization, which is democracy, political participation. And uh, this, uh, within the context of the political atmosphere at the time, Deng Xiaoping is trying to gain power. And he kind of supports this because Deng Xiaoping is a reformer, and and uh, for a very short period of time, he supports the intellectuals in his fight against the conservative leadership that he's really trying to overthrow um, in the late 1970s. But very quickly after he takes power, he realizes that these intellectuals are kind of a mixed bag. You, you don't necessarily want to give them free reign. And so this kind of, this is the beginning of that very uneasy relationship between intellectual students, people who are professionals, and the reformist groups themselves. And, and that's really going to provide the leadership later in the 1980s for these social movements to occur. But the economic repercussions of the reforms actually were felt widespread. And this is one of the reasons why the movements mo start perhaps in the intellectual sectors, but they're able to ripple out into the rest of the population. When you're saying intellectual sectors, is it safe to say we're usually talking about um, sectors that are driven also by younger people as well? Yes, and, and there's definitely a generational conflict aspect to this. In part because they're, they're trying to be trained for the jobs that, that the new economy is supposed to be bringing in. Precisely, and, and really what this, um, and. No, working from my own uh, expertise, which is, of course, student and youth movements, what this whole situation creates is an intellectual proletariat because you educate quite a few people to basically take on all of these new um, positions, these new modernizing positions, which are assumed to be coming up. But the economic conditions aren't really catching up. They're not moving as fast. And so you actually have a lot of people who basically are unemployed or they're underemployed. And um, they don't necessarily feel as though their talents are being used to the fullest extent. And yet they do have the resources, they have the knowledge, they have the information in order to push forth their resource or push forth their agenda by the late 1980s. And then in April of 18, or 1989, excuse me, 1989, not 1889, April of 1989, uh, uh, Yao Bang actually passed away in the middle of April. Yes. Uh, and uh, can we call them spontaneous demonstrations or, or mourning the, began to take place? Yeah, and the reason why Hu Yao Bing, uh, Hu Yao Bing was basically Deng's protege. And um, he was uh, brought into the highest levels of the Chinese Communist Party early in the 1980s. Um, although he was always under Deng's shadow, he kind of became the favorite symbol for these younger intellectuals um, and students uh, as a proponent of pro democracy and pro market reforms. And and also for trying to figure out the truth about what happened during the great cultural proletariat revolution. This was another major um, aspect for him. And the reason Hu Yangbing had a very interesting career at the end of the 1980s, because a, a slew of student demonstrations in 1986 and 1987 in Tiananmen Square, uh, basically calling for better economic opportunities, more democratic, um, more democratization, things of this nature, um, they were supported by Hu. And he was really the, the highest level in the Chinese Communist Party that was going to support them. And when the Chinese government at that time was able to basically suppress them, this was one of the contributing factors to Hu's downfall at, by the end of the late 1980s. And he was basically taken out of the party uh, leadership. And he was treated as, you know, that embarrassing
embarrassing aunt. Uh, what, what, what do you do with him? And when he dies of a heart attack, um, this basically provides the catalyst because he was, he basically it was public pressure that made the Chinese Communist Party own up to the fact that he was such a symbol of reform because they didn't necessarily know what to do with him. I, he was such an ambiguous symbol. And this is one of the reasons why it's his death that actually provides the focal point for all of these demonstrations to start coming and during the And some funeral. of the demonstrations, they go directly to Tiananmen Square. So the, the yes. folks who were living in Beijing, that was the place to go. Precisely. And that place that had been a symbol of the Communist Party, of Communist power, yeah. was now suddenly turning into a symbol of something quite different. Precisely. And actually, if you don't mind my just throwing in the history of that, um, because really, until the late 1970s, Tiananmen Square is seen as the as the emblem of the Communist Party's power, um, because it is very very tightly controlled by the Communist Party, as we are uh viewership probably knows uh, communist uh, regimes did not allow for independent organizations or protests during uh, in public squares um, and one of the reasons for that is because all of these public squares, all of these public demonstrations are intensely political, far more so in these countries than they would be in other places on the one hand because there's not as, mon uh, not as many avenues for normal political participation and so all of these political rituals, symbolic demonstrations things of this nature take on a far more heightened meaning and have a heightened impact than than they would, for example, in, in our country. And in 1976, another death occurred, which really starts to change the nature of Tiananmen Square, and that's Zhou Enlai. Um, and he was another reformer. Um, I believe he actually uh, helped to uh, negotiate with Henry Kissinger during Vietnam. And uh, when he dies in January of 1976, he's already fallen out of favor with the conservatives in the party who are at that time, um, the Gang of Four, they're kind of in power. And he's basically the public mourning is banned and not allowed. However, there are quite a few people in Beijing who remember him, remember him as a reformer and want to make a statement, want to mourn him officially. And so they kind of begin to go into Tiananmen Square. They start laying wreaths, they start laying white ribbons, things of this nature. And this really becomes the first post-1949 popular demonstration in Tiananmen Square that is not orchestrated by the government. And this is really the beginning of Tiananmen Square being used not just as the symbol of power for the Communist Party, but also the symbol of popular protest for people who are trying to, pro to somehow challenge the government's, um, <clears throat> the government's position. Now, in 1977, after um, Mao dies in September of 1976, his mausoleum is actually placed in Tiananmen Square. And that, of course, is a powerful kind of point that the government is reasserting its power. However, in the 1986-87 student demonstrations, they once again go to Tiananmen Square as kind of their focal point for their protest. And so really this, this history of going to Tiananmen Square, it, it has a, a few decades old at least. Um, and and those earlier, during those earlier decades, <clears throat> were those student protests put down? Uh, it, in the nicest way possible, I'm sure. Uh, oh, the 86, 87 one? Or even, the, even before that, as, as, as it became that focal point of, uh -huh. of comment that is not pro-government, yeah. how often did the government come in and actually every clear time. it out? Um, every time. Yeah, as, so as far as I know. A pattern of behavior that yes. you go in to, to do a, a, what we would consider maybe a peaceful protest, uh -huh, uh -huh. guaranteed the government will show up to what escort you elsewhere. It, it, well, that's that's the question, and because it always depends upon how the government defines its dangers and what it defines as basically being dangerous to it. And Zhao Enlai, of course, provided that catalyst precisely because he was seen as one of those ambiguous political leader figures whose whose interpretation of communism wasn't necessarily the one that was at that point in power with the conservative leadership. Um, now, of course, had it happened ten years before, ten years after, whatever, he, his funeral might not necessarily have engendered the same kind of protest and the same kind of reaction. But yes, whenever the people are perceived to be supporting an interpretation or an alternative means of socialism and most definitely anything outside of the socialist uh, rubric, then yes, the, the government is going to step in. And that's one of the things that the Chinese government has actually done very well is to monitor its public spaces in such a way that it, they, even though in, in the Tiananmen Square in June, April, May and June of 1989 was an enormous protest. It, it was absolutely phenomenal how large it was. And the fact that the government was still able to come in and reassert its control kind of gives a sense to exactly how how well the government has been able to monitor those public spaces. Sure. Well, I'll move back uh, back north a little bit, shall we say? So, in the late 1980s, we have we have pro market movement in China. 
We have Glasnost in uh, the Soviet Union. How did this change the nature of the relationship between the Soviet Union and China, Anne? Um, I think probably the the main if we're if we're talking about um, uh, you know the, the the Soviet the Soviet government was was definitely trying to norm you know stabilize the relationship because again they needed to cut their expenses and certainly military expenses in that part of the world was uh, was something that they wanted to um, that they wanted to address probably realistically probably the the economic the the improvement of economic relationship between the Soviet Union and China was probably the one that had um, the most tangible impact on people in the Soviet Union because this is where you start to see I mean well it's great for China too because a new market it has opened up for them, but we're talking about people sort of starved for consumer goods, and you know, um, and so all this kind of a flood of Chinese-produced consumer goods go into the Soviet Union towards people who've been, who haven't had that, and you know, say what you might about you know Chinese-made you know uh, consumer goods uh, at certain points in time, you know, they. they um, uh, they're very, very important. And so I think that especially considering other things that were going on in the Soviet Union in the 80s, um, you know, the glassness that you mentioned, um, this was really a time where people in the Soviet Union were focusing more on themselves um, domestically than they were on what it was that was going on in China. And so I think the economic, you know, kind of the, the tangible economic uh, products um, were definitely there. But other than that, I think the people in the Soviet Union were really focusing on either improving their own economic situation or sort of trying to figure out what was going on politically um, or uh, politically or culturally. And in China, we, do we have a slightly different reaction to the, the, the economic benefits that are taking place? Um, in terms of? The, the, uh, how did the normalizing of relationships, the opening up of a market, uh -huh. how, how did the average everyday person experience that? Basically, um, they, I don't know if they necessarily saw it through the rubric of Soviet relations. Um, obviously, when you're talking about the everyday, ordinary person, you're talking about someone who is probably in a village that's relatively isolated. Um, and the Chinese and the Soviets had been estranged for so long um, that the nuances might not necessarily have been seen quite so much there. However, there was, um, there was definitely a group of people, uh, entrepreneurs and joint venture capitalists that grew up that were able to make quite a bit of money out of this. And, and basically, they, and they definitely saw this, this opening up as, as something which was extremely beneficial to them and, and something that they definitely wanted to continue. So the events, we've, we've made it into April, obviously, the passing of Yao Bang. We uh, then see people spontaneously beginning to, to come into Tiananmen Square to, uh, to mourn uh, his death. Uh, how did this happen? I mean, literally, you know, the, the mythology, of course, is that mm -hmm. millions of people showed up spontaneously to have conversation about this. Yeah, and, and that's part of a mythology of almost all the major popular demonstrations. And actually, it wasn't so necessarily spontaneous. Um, since the 19, in 1988 already, you had intellectuals beginning to speak up again. And there were a number of major petitions um, throughout the winter of 88, 89 that were basically calling for greater democratization. Um, basically, the intellectual coterie that had already been established with Wei, uh, Wei Zhengzheng uh, was beginning to rear its head again. And this really gave kind of a, a, a vanguard force for these students who were, who were coming up. Um, and so they were able to really build off of a growing discontent, not just within the greater population, but also within who would be seen as their, their leaders, you know, the intellectual forces themselves. Uh, but the students, um, the students had very specific reasons to protest, and those were not just the freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and things like that, but also because economic conditions for them were actually getting worse than they were, proportionately speaking, for the rest of the population. Um, students had very little money. Um, they had very, and once again, very few economic opportunities. There weren't uh, necessarily the resources that the government was providing to these universities in order to get them to modernize at the level that the ideology or the reform programs were actually calling for. And so you had a major disconnect between <clears throat> the uh, the rhetoric of the government and what was actually happening in these universities. And so there were a lot of material reasons why people who might not know even about Hu Yaobang or who might not even know why, you know, everybody's going. There are a lot of material reasons why students um, in universities, very close quarters, you would be able to mobilize a lot of people very quickly, were willing to go out and support this, um, support these protest movements. Um, 
Now, the fact that it spilled out from perhaps an academic or student-centered movement into a widespread protest movement was in, in large part because the students were actually able to organize themselves very quickly and to come up with a coordinating committee that was then able to coordinate uh, protests not just in Beijing but in major cities and the university towns across China. And this really gave a structure to the discontent and the unrest. And Tiananmen Square kind of becomes the public center piece of this um, of this movement and with and we'll probably talk about this later some of the most iconic figures the hunger strikers the goddess of democracy all of these things are orchestrated by the students but both by the students in an effort to push forth their own needs and desires but as time goes on and this movement lasts um, between April 15th to June 4th uh, about seven weeks in this period the students make a concerted effort also to reach out to other groups the workers and the people of Beijing and in large part they get uh, a pretty receptive response to the point that the people of Beijing are trying to stop the tanks as they're coming into Tiananmen Square in early June. And so that's, uh, on the one hand, the spontaneousness or the spontaneity is part of this mythology that happened. Um, there are, of course, on the ground concrete reasons why people actually come in to support them. But it's certainly not orchestrated by um, Western imperialist, uh, uh, you know, elements, or, or they manipulated by outside forces. These, there were, there were definitely ac actual monetary and economic grievances that these people were trying to address, um, as well as grievances of individual liberties, and um, and, and they found a very receptive audience. Sure. So, and I, I always ask, I seem to always ask you this question: How was the world made aware of some of this stuff? I mean, obviously, June fourth is a date that a lot of people remember. Uh, some very iconic images that people will will know just by description, you know, the gentleman standing in front of the tanks, et cetera. But what was the global awareness of what was happening in Tiananmen Square, especially, you know, beginning in that middle of April, so to speak, leading up to June? Um, well, 1989 was a very busy year, as we, um, as we well know. So I think that I would imagine if you were journalists around that time, it probably was very exciting because no matter where you got sent, something was bound to, um, something was bound to happen. Um, as a Soviet historian, I would like to point out, I think part of um, the world was... Um, particularly aware, I think, of what was going on in, um, in China because of, the, um, of Gorbachev's visit. Um, Gorbachev's visit meant that, and, and the kind of the symbolic impact that this was supposed to have, the relationship with China, plus the very fact that Gorbachev was very popular with, with Western media. And so pretty much anywhere he went, you know, it, he, would be, um, he would be followed, meant that there were probably, there was perhaps kind of, an, uh, there were extra journalists kind of still, you know, still in China uh, during that time. Um, now, you know, the... Uh, uh, it, and this created a problem, I think, for the Chinese government because, of course, um, that was part. Of, they probably could have nipped this thing in the bud much sooner, and it wouldn't have had to go that far. But because of the extra attention, because of the visit, there was a limit to what they could really, um, what they could do at the early stages that they perhaps would have done, um, you know, under other um, conditions. But also, once the student demonstrations started, they certainly drew a lot of attention. And I think that mm -hmm. something like student demonstrations, given the fact that there have been previous times, in, you know, in, in, in recent decades where um, where that happened, I mean, they certainly um, are very attractive and very interesting and draw attention. Yeah, and well, actually, if you don't mind my adding that, um, the world attention was also kind of brought in because the Chinese was just one... <clears throat> one in a very long list of pro-democracy movements that had actually been happening since 1985, 1986. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Burma had just happened in August of 1988, where you had had a failed pro-democracy movement. But this garnered major international media attention. You had the Philippines. You had South Korea. And so really, it was kind of, there was a strange paradox, because on the one hand, no one really thought that the communist regimes would fall. But on the other hand, you're seeing all of these pro-democracy movements around. And so it, there was an expectation that these people would actually be coming in and trying to challenge the government. Now, we do have a, a map of uh, former Soviet Union and China that shows that very long border that, uh, that we, we mentioned earlier. Uh, what was the reaction in the Soviet Union to the events taking place in Tiananmen Square? What, I mean, what would I, ha as a, as a uh, resident there, what would I have noticed? What, did I, what would I have thought about? Um, I think, again, um, for the for the general population of the um, of the then um, of the then Soviet Union, I think um, you know the reactions. I mean, I think the reactions really um, uh, really varied. I think um, in general, I mean, there was 
um, there was tremendous shock. I mean, I think that the you know the demonstrations themselves and the protest movement itself. I mean, that's very exciting. You know, connections mm -hmm. to 68, connections to Berman 88, mm -hmm. um, all of that. But I think that once we you know once we get to uh, uh, your question was specifically about June 4th or more generally. Either one, actually. How how aware would people have been of the events leading up to June 4th, and then and then what was the reaction to June 4th? Um, I think in the Soviet Union, um, it really depended on who you are, because again, I think the, the majority of the population were really just focused on themselves um, and on their own issues. But you did have certain, um, uh, you know, sort of newly formed opposition groups within the Soviet Union who certainly thought that that was very interesting, exciting, and it fit with what they were, uh, with what they were doing themselves. But I think for the most part, again, I mean, what's interesting about the Soviet Union is that for so long there was a very strong kind of internationalist aspect to Soviet propaganda. People in the Soviet Union were supposed to deeply care about everything that was happening around the world. And I think that in some ways um, we can interpret that as a sign of protest, that people were fed up with caring about what was happening, the poor starving children here, there, everywhere, um, or, you know, movements of, of some sort. They just really wanted to focus, you know, really focus on themselves. But of course, once we get to actually, you know, June 4th and the, 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 then those images, the iconic images, you know, the man against the tank um, and, and the violence that went along with it, that was a little bit, um, you know, a little bit harder to ignore. Mm -hmm. But in, this, in the Soviet point of view, of course, for them, I mean, um, uh, Deanna mentioned earlier, you know, you know, the 68 in, in, in um, Czechoslovakia, we have, you know, Hungary in 56, I mean, all these kind of, um, the reception for many people in the Soviet Union, I think, would have been different simply because they were used to interpreting these things a little bit differently, right? That, that to them, I mean, okay, extreme violence, of course, is unfortunate, but, you know, that's what you have to do when people are criticizing the government, right? I mean, what else can you do with those kinds yeah, yeah, yeah. of, um, you know, with those kinds of people? How big have the crowds gotten in Tiananmen Square? And were they at their biggest on June 4th, or had they been bigger earlier? They had actually been bigger earlier. It had kind of um, leveled off to a, a pretty um, a pretty stable kind of population that had really occupied Tiananmen Square. And so you had the occupiers in June 4th, and they were really the holdouts, the last holdouts. And um, the crowds, it's actually, I, I was looking around for any kind of consistent numbers, and it's, it's kind of difficult to tell. Um, basic, before, there were numbers of demonstrations. That, it, that had anywhere from 1,000 to 100,000 people basically coming in and, um, and demonstrating against the government, uh, both students and, of course, uh, people from outside. Uh, and, and here we're talking not only, of course, workers, but also the citizens of Beijing. And the thing is that not only were there crowds, but they were also coordinating their own actions. There was um, the Beijing community basically started their own coordinating committee, which would work together with the workers and things of this nature. And they would bring together a couple of hundred thousand to a million people in Tiananmen Square. Um, now, whenever the actual unrest happened, uh, I saw somewhere between 100,000 people were actually in the square, but I keep flipping through my thing because it's actually, it's very difficult to say. Um, much like however many people died at Tiananmen Square is, is very difficult to say, but the, the square itself can hold anywhere between 600,000 and a million people. And it was filled to capacity. Um, in, in most cases. And I think that what people have to keep in mind is the how long this was sustained. And this yes. began in the middle of April. Yeah, it, it, and, and for it was seven not weeks. until June 4th. Exactly, yeah. So, you know, six, eight weeks yeah. where, where people were coming in daily, which exactly. you would expect the crowd to ebb and flow over that time yeah, period. Yeah, yeah. And, and really, the important thing is, I mean, the crowds, the demonstrations were phenomenal. They were awesome. You know, when you're bringing together so many people, this is, this is awesome um, in terms of visual aspects. But really, the thing that sustained it was the coordination. The fact that basically they were able to come up with a, an independent, basically second society, an autonomous working group that was pretty much able to run things and keep things running um, right up until the very end. And this happened not only within the student community, but within other communities and sectors in the society. And, and this pretty much is one of the reasons why it was able to last for the seven weeks. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that there isn't any infighting or that there weren't, you know, definite right, yeah. problems within it. And, and certainly within the student movement, I can say there were two very strong factions, one which was for kind of mitigating the protest and, and moving away, especially once the government begins to make sounds that um, it really wants them to leave Tiananmen Square. And then another, um, another faction, which was led by the hunger striker Chai Ling, uh, that wanted to stay in the square no matter what cost, basically to 
sacrifice themselves to whatever may come. And this is, in effect, what actually happens. And the hunger strikers are really there for the longest. And, and that, that's a very significant difference in motivation, you know, to, yes. to make a point and be willing to put your life on the line. Those are two Precisely. very different motivations. But on June 4th, we, we finally have the military coming in, yeah. uh, troops as well as tanks, as, mm -hmm. as people know from the images we've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, how, what was the scene like? When, when the tanks, when the troops came in, did, did people suddenly say, oh, that time for me to get out of here? Uh, you know, and... Um yeah, the, the scene, it was actually uh, Chai Ling, who is probably one of the famous, um, she's a woman, stu a female student leader, and um, probably one of the famous uh, hunger strike leaders. She uh, gave uh, this incredible um, interview of what it was, because she was basically in there, you know, right until the, t the very end. And the interview, um, which was given later, was, I am Chai Ling, and I'm still alive. And, and basically, she, she describes a scene in which it's just mass chaos, that people are basically running. Um, it, and one of the things that's interesting about when, the troops come in because they actually come in earlier in the night before June 3rd, um, 10:30 or so. Is that the citizens of Beijing really start to try and prevent these troops from entering the tanks from entering Tiananmen Square? They set up barricades. Um, they actually fight against the army that is coming, and it's very difficult. Uh, Obviously, we always focus on the demonstrators, but if you think about it from the perspective of an, uh, an officer or a soldier, it's very difficult to fire upon your own citizens, especially when you can tell that they are, we're talking women, children, you know, I mean, you can tell that they are not enemy combatants. And so in that case, not all of these soldiers necessarily moved against, um, at least at the beginning, there, there was a lot of ambiguity. Uh, but especially by the end, because with, when you look at it from the other side, you also have these citizens which are pretty much now mounting defensive protests against the army. And this is considered an attack. And, and, and so that um, in, one, in one way kind of like steps up the stakes, um, pushes up the stakes. And the, uh, the ask are however many people were killed and were wounded. I've seen, once again, any estimates from around 200 to 300, which is the official government um, uh, estimates for however many people were killed in about 3,000, I believe, that were wounded, to Red Cross estimated two to 3,000 that were killed, and maybe two or three times that who, which were actually wounded. And then there are estimates which fall far ab above that as well. But it's because we don't necessarily know. Um, at this point, it really was just mass, utter chaos. You, you had people running in, uh, to get out of Tiananmen Square. Um, and then, of course, the government to, or the tanks have circled in. And, um, and it's a square. I mean, there are a limited number of ways exactly. out. We're not talking about uh, yeah. you know, an open field where you can just run any direction. Precisely, yes. And in, in terms of you know, how I'm sure that many people were able to find sanctuary in various citizens' houses and things like that. However, once the military has taken over the square, then it's going to assert its control over the rest of the um, rest of Beijing as well. And so in terms of how many people were killed that night or how, what people did that night, and then the mopping up uh, operation, which lasts for the next two or three weeks, uh, there's quite a few... And, and we do know there were casualties. We, oh, yeah. we can argue about what the number was. We know that some of those were were civilians. They were innocents. Mm -hmm. They were folks who were mm -hmm. uh, who were not doing anything that you know by our standards, of course, we would consider to be objectionable. But perhaps mm -hmm. even by Chinese standards, were not objectionable. Mm -hmm. uh, there were also organizers who were targeted by this. Mm -hmm. And the mop up, as you referred to it afterwards, mm -hmm. that's when they really started to go after those yes. uh, after those organizers. Yeah. And what's interesting is that they actually go after the organizers of the workers and the citizens organizations actually even a little bit worse than they do after the students. And there were many workers who were actually tried and executed um, that were organizers from those particular organizations. Uh, many of the student leaders uh, were definitely tried. M many of them were actually sent into exile uh, if they didn't have to serve long prison terms beforehand. And it, really, they cut off the head of the student body, but they didn't necessarily hurt the student body itself quite as Is much. Is that in part because they recognized that as the economy was going to shift, they were going to need those, those that, that quote, knowledge-based workforce? Exactly. In part, yes. And in part also because, and this is actually, this is something which you, you see actually time and time again in repressive societies, because young people have, a, there's a very certain mythology about young people and young protests in these societies. And that, and that is that young people, since they are the future, and they are going to have to bring the society into the future, they have a certain leeway for criticism, which is not afforded to the 
the older citizens. And so, you know, it, it, it's not to say that they're allowed to completely challenge the government, but it, but it is seen to a certain extent that this is their role to not just take society as it's given to them, but to somehow try and make it their own. And, and so there's a certain amount of leniency which will be given traditionally to young people and students that will not be granted to older citizens who are by this point seen as if you're protesting now then you're already deformed and we're, we're sorry but you, you pretty much you've missed the mark and, and young people can perhaps be rehabilitated. Yeah, there's time. Still. Exactly. There's still time. <clears throat> Journalists were eventually banned uh, and that has sort of made it difficult for us to gather information uh, about what happened in Tiananmen Square, especially <clears throat> after that. How have we been able to learn about the events of Tiananmen Square? Uh, well, the, the, the mop-up, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, well, you do have um, th th uh, there are a couple of different things, and I, and I think certainly um, the, the the effort by the by the regime to clamp down on on the coverage of the events, because you have, mm -hmm. I mean, it, what, what's so remarkable about it is that you have um, so much kind of there was live there was li live feed from Tiananmen Square when all um, much of the earlier parts of uh, what Deanna described were taking place. I mean, really kind of unprecedented, um, mm -hmm. and something that ne clearly needed to be stopped in order to make the mop-up operations. Um, Success, um, successful and possible, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and successful. Um, and I think it, when the, the foreign journalists, I mean, they're being, um, they're certainly not allowed to transmit. Um, there's, there's, there are efforts made to expel them. Um, you have efforts by journalists to try to communicate um, over the phone. Um, we have film smuggled out. Many of the images that we have from the um, Tiananmen Square um, was actually filmed that was smuggled out of the country um, for uh, for those journalists. Um, it's interesting that you know, speaking of the reaction of the rest of the world, I mean, it. it um, you know, the one of the what happened in Taiwan, for example, is that the government, I mean, obviously outraged and kind of extra scared because it <laughs> potentially affects them more than the rest of the world. Um, but they lifted a ban on phone communications with China in the hopes that this would this would allow, even given that the, the government was enforcing this um, uh, enforcing this ban, that this would be a way to get some inform you know some information out. Mm -hmm. But certainly the fact that there was that there were limits. I mean, I think that this was. It's not, it's, only, it's not the only reason, of course, but part of the reason why um, there's so many debates about the numbers is, I mean, one big part, of course, is that this, uh, the, the Chinese government was definitely trying to promote a certain kind of vision. Like, when they talk about their num official numbers, mm -hmm. they emphasize the casualties on the part of the troops. So, mm -hmm. you know, yes, people died, but it was the valiant troops trying to, you know, protect, um, uh, uh, pr uh, protect the government. But it was certainly this debate about, you know, were you there? How do you know? I mean, this mm -hmm. is who made, you know, is it the Chinese government that's manipulating the truth, or is it, you know, the American media yeah. or Western media more mm -hmm. broadly that's manipulating the truth? That's really a bit, very important important part of the debate. Yeah, and, and one of the interesting parts about this is because this was, as you said, I mean, the trialing interview happens, you know, I am trialing and I'm still alive. That's because it's happening, you know, as this is actually going. And some of the most incredible testimonies and, and transcripts are actually occurring. But um, it's an interesting commentary on how much history and events need to be given meaning afterwards. That we know so much about this and yet we know so little. You know, that, that we really have so much information and yet we, we really still are trying to wrap our heads around what is Tiananmen and, and what actually happened and, and what does it actually mean. Because the, the whole process of actually giving meaning and, and coming to terms with what, with what actually happened was really clamped down afterwards. And, and so it, it's kind of, it, it's become an event that is a non-event, you know, and especially in China itself. So how has that shaped? What have what have we learned? What, how has it shaped China today? Um, in terms of in terms of political protest, obviously, um, it had a profound effect on the ability of people to organize and to speak out independently, especially in the 1990s. Um, in, however, it, uh, and, and I don't want to make a blanket because we're getting a little bit closer to you know today's history, and so I don't necessarily want to make a blanket statement here, but the Chinese government does seem to have done a very good job in, in actually creating the boundaries um, that are acceptable for the population about learning about Tiananmen. And, uh, there are obviously there are no, numerous um, memorial sites and, and commemorative organizations that try to keep the memory of Tiananmen alive, but that's also in some ways also a commentary on how successfully the Chinese government has done has been in dampening the information about this, this time uh, in, in the country itself. And, and of course, it leads to, um, in terms of political changes, it, it leads to a shakeup in, in the government. Um, it also leads to a, a more acceleration of reforms. And one of the reasons why China is the economic powerhouse, let's say, uh, that it is today is, is partly because in, 1990, in the 1990s, it opened up far more than it had in the 1980s, kind of as a response to the Tiananmen aftermath. Um, so that's one of those indirect um, reasons. But in terms of the event itself, it's still one of those that's, that's trying to find its way.
trying to find its meaning. So, Anne, you, you're, you're, uh, you're one of the main participants and you've helped organize this particular series here. So I have to ask you, is this one of the events that you think is symptomatic of the end of the Cold War or was this one of the causes of the end of the Cold War? Um, I think part of why and I think... I probably should point out it's a little unfair. I mean, it's only been 20 years, so can we really, can we really judge and you know, how far back do we have to go um, for it to be history where we can get a clear understanding of it? Given, given, all of those, <laughs> given all of those statements, which one is it, Anne? Um, uh, both. Uh, uh, both. Uh, I always like to go for. Um, I like to go for both. I mean, we included. Um, you know, we included this event in in our series not just because it happened in 1989, but in some ways because it's it, it stands out, right? I mean, in 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 in, one, in, in a way, it is. Um, it is one of the many countries around the world where a certain combination of economic and social problems, pressure, you know, development, and so on, um, led to the beginning of a movement against um, the government, or at least against certain policies of the government. Mm -hmm. we, we want to potentially differentiate between um, between the two. But if every other um, example that we've either covered in our in our panels or are going to be covering, especially in the fall, when we're going to talk about the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism throughout the Eastern Bloc, I mean, there this movement went in the particular direction, right? And and certainly, we'll have many opportunities later um, in, you know, in the year to discuss whether that was for the be you know what, that was for the best or not. In China, I mean, what happened in China was that you have this kind of this excitement, right? The moment when all these questions are being asked and questioned, the government. I mean, we don't want to say the government was threatened, but certainly the government is is, is under attack. But it goes the I mean, it, it goes the other way. The government cracks down, right? I mean, mm -hmm. even Eastern Europe, the government sort of decides that it doesn't want to push anymore. Yeah. In, in China, the government cracks down. So in in, in that sense, I mean, when we look at um, China today, China as the new superpower, um, it's not so much um, sort of the that the, this contributed to the end of the Cold War, but rather the rise of China in the last couple of decades are really symptomatic of the post Cold War New World world order. I mean, this is the emphasis on economics, mm -hmm. the, the, the learning about the dangers of, um, you know, of, of, um, of political, you know, of leaving room open for political mm -hmm. reforms. I mean, these are all kind of valuable lessons that the Chinese government learned and has applied. And one can make an argument that it has, it has been, you know, fairly successful. We haven't really had, I mean, they've, they've been very good about controlling, you know, controlling information, um, you know, about what happened. And, 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 and it kind of it went in this, you know, in, in, in this particular um, um, in this particular way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Beijing Olympics. I was, was just going to bring that up. Yeah. I mean, what, what, you could consider that to be one of the greatest PR successes that mm -hmm. China has had, that it's, mm -hmm. it's reformed itself sufficiently in terms of human rights and, and other issues that it was deserving of having uh, having the Olympics. Now, I do have to point one out. Interpretation. Well, yeah. One interpretation. One yeah. interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. We, we did a panel discussion on this last year, and there were a couple of people there. Anne was one of them, and we, we talked about whether that was you know good to have the Olympics there or not. But what are the lessons? What do you think are the major lessons that, that people should take away from the events of Tiananmen Square specifically? Well, and actually, if you don't mind my jumping in, because while Anne was talking, I, and of course, I, I completely agree with everything that she's saying. Um, and, and, and just to bring it back really to 1989, because what you're saying basically about how events went the other way, that really is, that is why Tiananmen Square is the model that it is, that it was a violent end. And, and the whole idea of 1989 is that there were peaceful revolutions at a time when revolution was seen as only really being able to be violent. And so Tiananmen Square is really kind of the, the anti-case study to what, what we're actually seeing in Eastern Europe itself. However, in terms of what was happening on the ground in Eastern Europe during that time, the Tiananmen option becomes a major scare factor for these pro-democracy movements. And it, East Germany in the, in the autumn of 1989 considers whether or not it wants to take the Tiananmen option. Basically, the Chinese government opens up the very strong possibility that events all around the world could have gone another way in 1989. And I just really want to emphasize that because, I mean, at that time, June is when this all occurs, where, where you know, everything's all happy and, and uh, you know, peacefully occurring and peacefully developing in Eastern Europe itself. Things most definitely had a mo or the governments there most definitely had a model for non-peaceful clamping down, and, and that's really one of the major important significances, I would say, of the Tiananmen Square massacre, especially at that point in 1989. Anne, any closing comments? Um, yes, um, I, I have actually three valuable lessons, and I'll do them really, really quickly. One, I think, is um, kind of courage and, and the role of the individual. I think, and certainly that iconic image that you know that we have. Um, Time Magazine actually named the unnamed man. Nobody still knows exactly who he, you know, he Tank Man. Um, he was named one of the hundred most influential people of the 20th century, and I think that it's something that we want to remember because in this kind of the, in the century of mass movement, um, the power of the individual um, is is so striking. Um, the other one is control of history and control of reality. I mean, I think Tiananmen Square. 
and then this kind of touches on so many of the things that we already discussed. Mm -hmm. um, the ability of the Chinese government to control um, the information around the event, um, the fact that you know that uh, most people in China don't actually care, um, you know what, what what happened then, because there's so many other you know things, and in that sense, the economic reforms certainly uh, contributed to. I mean, you know, the question is, you know, why hasn't there been another one? You know, how we are we are, you know are we ready for another one? And certainly, the economic reforms and the prosperity that came with them, at least for enough people, um, you know, to to get them to not really care so much about political protests because they're risky. Now they have something to lose. They have you know property. And and some amount of wealth that would be um, that they would not want to lose. But the last thing is, I mean, this economic, the, this issue of economic changes. I mean, one of the things that we see is the rise of the middle class, and this, mm -hmm. and that can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. I mean, historically, we see if we look at certain, you know, transformations of different regimes, uh, when you have the rise of the middle class, it raises the potential. Mm -hmm. And so once these people have some kind of, pro you know, property and some kind of uh, wealth, it nurtures aspirations for political participation. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we can see that perhaps, you know, th this was a 20-year delay or 20-plus year delay. But ultimately, there's still some issues on the table that have not quite been resolved, and it's possible that the economic, you know, that the economic prosperity is actually going to eventually uh, lead to some kind of a political um, movement. Whether it's going to be, you know, pro-democracy or pro-something else is, mm -hmm. is a different issue, but some kind of potential for um, still potential for political change um, in China. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, very good. I want to thank both of you for being here. Uh, we had with us future faculty. Uh, future faculty fellow Deanna Woolley, sorry about that, <laughs> and we had assistant professor uh, Ann Livshiz, both from the Department of History. I want to thank you for joining us. This was one of a number of conversations we're having devoted to the end of the Cold War, as we like to say, uh, the events that either precipitated it or are symptomatic of it. The events were the panel discussion was brought to you by the American Democracy Project, as well as the Department of History and the Mike Down Center for Indiana Politics. We also want to thank CATV for recording this and ask you to look for this and other uh, panel discussions related to this topic and others, not only on CATV, but also on MDON. Thank you very much and have a good day.